With at least two next generation fighter programs now drawing funds from Pentagon coffers, there's one looming question dominating the airspace over internet forums, the world's military installations, and advanced aviation research facilities alike. Are the days of dogfights really over? Is dogfighting dead? Let's dive into this question. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. When my wife and I are scrolling through YouTube at night looking for something to watch, we make a lot of jokes about videos with titles that ask questions that you could answer in one sentence or less. And this might seem like one of them. After all, I can answer the question, is dogfighting dead, in one word. No. But the truth is, America's defense establishment has been operating under the impression that close quarters air-to-air -air battles are a thing of the past for long enough now that it's become the prevailing wisdom of our day. So in order to really answer the question, is dogfighting dead, we really need to explore why so many people think it is, and why that may not necessarily be the right conclusion to draw. Now, as lengthy as this video is sure to become, my efforts to get to the bottom of this question, is dogfighting dead, were considerably lengthier. So I'll make sure to include links to my full-length analysis on things like what went wrong in the skies over Vietnam, how dogfights played out during Desert Storm, and my breakdown of the infamous 2015 report indicating that the F-35 failed to perform adequately in dogfights against the F-16. The truth is, in order to really appreciate the nature of this question, you need to know that the most recent air-to-air -air kill scored by an American aircraft came back in 2017, when a U.S. Navy Super Hornet shot down a Syrian-flagged Su-22 as it was bombing American-backed Syrian Democratic forces. The interaction was not much of a dogfight, but it was the first air-to-air -air engagement carried out by an American fighter since Operation Allied Force over Kosovo all the way back in 1999. But the last time American jets really found themselves in a serious mid-air scrap was all the way back in 1991 over Iraq. So with more than three decades now separating today's aviators from America's last dogfights and stealth becoming increasingly the norm, it's no wonder the Defense Department seems to be leaning away from the idea that air-to-air -air combat in close quarters should be a priority. There is no denying that technological trends back that growing sentiment. But this isn't the first time the United States has questioned the future of air combat. And as many aviation buffs and historians will tell you in the comments below, assuming dogfights were dead just because of the introduction of new technologies didn't pan out quite like America would have hoped the last time we found ourselves having this debate. The truth is, American pilots struggled in the dogfights over Vietnam because of a litany of compounding reasons, from training policies and regulations, to rules of engagement, to technological shortcomings, and even pilot error, which you can really attribute to the training pipeline. But even if we limit our discussion to contemporary air combat, it's hard to deny the fact that after more than two decades of counter-terror operations, the vast majority of America's pilots, and even senior leaders at this point, have spent the entirety of their careers operating in uncontested airspace against adversaries with few or no air assets to put up a fight. It seems logical, then, to question whether or not the collective experiences of operations over Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and elsewhere could potentially be skewing the perspective of today's prevailing wisdom. But as we dive deeper into this question, I want to make an important note, and that's while many within America's defense apparatus seem to believe air combat has become a sniper's game rather than a boxer's, my own personal experiences with American fighter pilots in the Air Force, Marine Corps, and Navy have made it clear to me that training for air combat is still a very serious matter within America's fixed-wing communities. American fighter pilots do train to win fights of all sorts, but it does seem true that within fighter pilot culture, aviator sunglasses are still in, but dogfights are clearly out. And to be clear, those pilots aren't alone. A number of senior defense officials seem to agree, with some even hinting at the idea that America's next air superiority fighter being developed in the NGAD program may end up with more in common with the B-21 Raider than the F-22 Raptor. 
As General Herbert Hawk Carlyle, the former commander of America's Air Combat Command, argued back in 2017, substantial weapons capacity, fuel range, and low observability may all prove more important than dogfighting performance when it comes to securing air supremacy in the decades to come. In that regard, the F-22 Raptor's combination of high performance and stealth capabilities could be seen not as a sign of things to come, but rather as a bridge between modern data-focused air combat and the olden days, when dogfights were decided by things like turn radius, power-to-weight ratios, and a pilot's ability to maneuver his or her aircraft. And although things like basic fighter maneuvers, or BFM, and advanced fighter maneuvers, AFM, which are both focused on air-to-air -air combat, are still a common part of the fighter pilot syllabus, you'll often hear pilots touting these training exercises not as the development of important combat skills, but rather as a good way to learn the capabilities and limits of their aircraft. This debate about the future of dogfighting was prominent in discussions about the F-35 back in 2015, when David Axe at War is Boring published the details of a report he obtained outlining how the F-35 performed very poorly in mock dogfights against the F-16. It wasn't until later that we learned the F-35 competing in these drills lacked radar-absorbent materials, elements of its targeting system, and was flying with software limitations that were meant to prevent the pilot from placing stress on the airframe. But even if we were to dismiss the fact that the F-35 was fighting with one hand digitally tied behind its back, many took greater umbrage at the fact that the exercise itself just didn't really reflect how a dogfight would really go in the modern era. I'm going to go ahead and quote a response from Lieutenant Colonel David Chip Burke back in 2017. The whole concept of dogfighting is so misunderstood and taken out of context. There is some idea that when we talk about dogfighting, it's one airplane's ability to get another plane six and shoot it with a gun. That hasn't happened in American planes in maybe 40 years. I want to be clear here that Colonel Burke knows what he's talking about. At the time, and maybe still today, he was the only Marine pilot to have hours logged in both the F-35 and the Air Force's reigning King of the Skies, F-22. But that's not all. Colonel Burke's a graduate of Navy Fighter Weapons School, you might know it as Top Gun, and he has more than 2,800 hours logged across both American stealth fighters, the F-16 Fighting Falcon, and the F-A-18 Super Hornet. In the arena of air combat, Colonel Burke is a subject matter expert. Back in 2017, he did an interview with Business Insider, where he explained that the very premise of close quarters dogfights really runs counter to how modern American aviators are trained to engage the enemy, and for good reason. The F-35 offers better situational awareness than any tactical aircraft in history, and while the F-22 sensor suite isn't quite as impressive, it's still touted by the Air Force as capable of providing first kill opportunity against threats, or the ability to engage enemy fighters before they even know you're there. To paraphrase the colonel's point, just because the F-22 is capable of winning close quarters battles against the most advanced fighters on the planet doesn't make that the most logical approach to a fight. Instead, it makes much more sense to keep your distance and play to the aircraft's long-range advantage. And you can hear that sentiment echoed in statements made by other fighter pilots as well. In the minds of some of America's combat aviators, jets like the F-22, with its thrust vectoring aerobatics and onboard cannon, are little more than technologically advanced relics flying in the modern age. A dinosaur in an Apple Watch. This time, I'll quote Air Force F-16 pilot Rick Sheff, who said this in an online discussion and gained some fame shortly thereafter. The Raptor is about as cool as it gets, and it is the greatest air superiority fighter the world has ever seen. But like the F-15C that it was originally designed to replace, it is an airplane without a real mission in modern conflict. When was the last time an American fighter killed another fighter in an air-to-air -air engagement? Go look it up. I'll wait. Now, that quote may have made some of us cringe, but the truth is, the idea that stealth trumps the need for speed or maneuverability has been increasingly in vogue ever since the F-117 Nighthawk first entered service all the way back in 1983. And the massive and intricate ballet of combat aircraft leveraged in 1991's Gulf War really seemed to substantiate this shift. 
Throughout the brief conflict, the U.S. lost five F-16 Fighting Falcons, two F-15 Eagles, two Hornets, one F-14 Tomcat, and one F-4G Wild Weasel. The Hornets were the slowest of this bunch and were rated for speeds as high as Mach 1.7. The F-117 Nighthawk, on the other hand, took on the most dangerous air operations of the war, flying unaccompanied into Baghdad, which was arguably the most heavily defended city on Earth at the time, with no means of engaging air defenses or enemy fighters, and didn't lose a single airframe, despite waltzing around enemy airspace at a leisurely 600 miles per hour. There's really no denying that the war above Iraq in 1991 proved the efficacy of stealth in modern air warfare and substantiated a shift away from prioritizing high speeds and brain-mashing Gs in combat aircraft. Six years after Desert Storm, the first F-22 took flight, and the U.S. hasn't even considered developing a fighter without intrinsic stealth capabilities ever since. But there are other lessons to be gleaned from Desert Storm's air campaign that tend to go under-discussed in our modern era of uncontested air dominance, particularly the chaos that ensues when two nations with sizable air forces go to war. In a complex environment with hundreds, if not thousands, of air assets operating within a contested region, the favored American tactics of avoiding dogfights and engaging from long distances can easily become untenable. Technological limitations, human error, mission requirements, and rules of engagement can all force intercepts to occur in closer quarters than a pilot might prefer. As retired F-14 radar intercept officer and my fellow YouTuber Ward Carroll explained to me in a conversation we had about stealth last year, I'm going to submit that dogfighting is not dead, because if you've ever been in a major exercise, not to mention an air-to-air -air war like Desert Storm, then you know that in the heat of battle, there's confusion, there's all kinds of chaos, and ultimately, a bandit is going to sneak through, and you'll find yourself basically engaged one-on-one -on -one with the bad guys in an old-school kind of way. And the data supports Ward's assertions, despite the fact that the Iraqi Air Force largely opted not to engage coalition forces, instead hightailing it across the border to Iran where they'd be safe from prowling American and Allied fighters, there were still numerous instances of Iraqi aircraft bringing the fight into close quarters by merit of confusion if nothing else. The Iraqi Air Force was seemingly no slouch at the time, with 40 squadrons fielding a total of some 700 combat aircraft, but importantly, only around 55 of them were modern MiG-25 and MiG-29s that were capable of carrying the sort of air-to-air -air missiles they'd need to stand and swing with American fighters. The U.S., on the other hand, brought 150 Eagles and Strike Eagles, 212 Fighting Falcons, 109 Tomcats, and 160 67 Hornets to the fight alone, not to mention those of its coalition allies. But despite this massive numbers advantage, or perhaps even because of the volume of aircraft in play, air combat maneuvering, or good old-fashioned dogfights, still took place in the early days of this fight. According to an analysis compiled by the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, out of the 33 separate engagements of fixed-wing aircraft during Desert Storm, 13 occurred within visual range, despite coalition AWACS identifying enemy fighters at an average range of around 70 nautical miles. The Iraqi forces, on the other hand, had no command and control aircraft in the sky, meaning that despite the coalition having a clear advantage in terms of both situational awareness and beyond visual range weapons, nearly 40% of air engagements still closed to within visual range before they ended. And out of those 13 engagements that took place within visual range, four required their pilots to execute air combat maneuvering, or dogfight, to engage their targets. So let's sum this all up. In a situation where friendly fighter aircraft armed with modern beyond visual range missiles outnumbered similarly equipped enemy fighters by a ratio of more than 11 to 1, where friendly AWACS were providing situational awareness of enemy aircraft and the opposition had no such benefit, a bit more than 12% of engagements still resulted in dogfights. In situations where friendly and enemy aircraft found themselves within visual range of one another, it came down to a dogfight about a third of the time. 
Of course, it's not lost on me that today's F-35s and F-22s would operate very differently than the aircraft in Desert Storm, but it bears considering. How would these figures have looked if Iraq had fielded a similarly sized and technologically capable air force? Because it stands to reason that if there were hundreds of more well-equipped Iraqi fighters in the sky, there would have been many more within visual range engagements, and as such, a much higher volume of dogfights as well. But if you find yourself wondering if this data can still hold up after 30 years of advancements in missile and aircraft technology, you should know that two-thirds of the air-to-air -air kills scored by coalition forces during Desert Storm all came via the AIM-7 Sparrow missile, which is still in service today, though it is being phased out. And if you think fifth-generation fighters are going to make a huge difference, we should talk about that too. Because the truth is, fourth-generation fighters aren't going anywhere for a long time to come. The Air Force's latest batch of F-15EX fighters, slated to replace aging F-15Cs and Ds, are rated for a whopping 20,000-hour lifespan. That's more than three times that of any F-35. And observations of the air warfare over Ukraine amid Russia's ongoing and troubled invasion further emphasize the point that 21st century warfare cannot yet be divested from 20th century hardware. Today, the U.S. has around 450 stealth fighters between the F-22 and F-35 combined. That's the largest and most potent cadre of stealth platforms on the planet, but it still only represents about 20% of America's fighter force. But that's actually a huge lead as compared to the competition. Russia has the second largest air force in the world, but only 14 stealth fighters. China ranks third in terms of total air force size, but does better in the stealth front, with a bit better than 150 J-20s now in service. What all of this really means is that if a 21st century air war were to break out between these global powers, at any point in the next 30 years, it would primarily be fought with 20th century aircraft. The real truth is, today, dogfights really are dead. And that's thanks in no small part to this period of relative stability that we've enjoyed in the decades since the close of World War II. There have, of course, been conflicts that saw aircraft engaging one another during this time, but there hasn't been a real fight between globe-spanning forces since the fall of the Axis powers. But today, with tensions once again simmering to a boil between national competitors on the world stage, dogfights are probably only as dead as the large-scale conflicts that bring them about. With enough fighters in the air, there will always be scraps between small groups of them. The only real way to keep dogfights in the grave is to keep wars between global powers right there in the hole with them. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.